Are you there, Karen? Hold on, I don't see her. Do you see her? Did we lose our speaker and not realize it? Oh, I don't feel any bad. Oh no, we did. I heard someone leave. I didn't realize it was her. I lost the connection. She's trying to get back in. She just said at 506. So is that oh. her? No. That's no. Like somebody else. That was Mohammed. Yeah. The moment where you sit there and go, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> the joys of technology. <laughs> um, I, I joke that my husband and I share a space and, and um, you don't know how much your marriage is going to survive. Do you have a Zoom? session together and um there's moments where I'm, I'm pretty sure that people look at like my face on some zoom sessions like she has no rbf or she has she has no ability to control her rbf right it's like and i and i i thought there was an interesting thing that said recently um somebody said was actually told in a session in a chat session says you may not be saying anything but your your face says it all and i'm turning off your camera so <laughs> so Karen, we're not going to turn off your camera. We want to hear lots from you. So I'm so happy you could join us again. Um, are you okay and ready to rock and roll? Yes, I think so. Um, let's see. I'm just resetting. So I, I, you know, good to have a fallback. I'm here on my computer now, or I'm sorry, on my phone. So excellent. Okay. All right. I'm going to let you set up your, your bio and, and you'll get uh, started. Just tell me uh, I've got your slides ready to go and, okay. um, and I'll share, um, screen what you tell me and uh, we'll get started. That sounds great. Okay, I think you can go ahead and share the screen. That would be fantastic. Did you go muted? Brigitte? Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, just give us a short synopsis of you too, if you, you could, while I'm doing this so we can hear sure. more about Absolutely. you. So, um, thanks. So, I am, first of all, really excited to be here today. Um, when I, just prior to my losing the connection where you were talking about um, how this can be great practice in, um, in public speaking. And I, I do so much appreciate that. Um, I have had an opportunity to, um, to have, you know, engage in these kinds of um, events more during COVID than ever before, which actually was kind of nice because I, you know, can sit here and, um, you know, have my slippers on while I'm also, you know, publicly speaking. Uh, so it's really um, helped me to become a bit more comfortable with something that, you know, prior to this, like, really wasn't at all. Um, so I, I ask for everyone to be patient with me, bear with me, and I look forward to your feedback and your thoughts and, and your reactions to everything that, um, that I'm going to share today. Um, so a bit about myself. Um, uh, again, my name Karen Hathaway Viani. I'm I consider myself an innovation strategist. Um, it, that's my role in my my current um, job, and also just who I am. Um, I really have a passion for developing um, solutions, uh, primarily oriented around people, process, and technology, and. Um, and I wanna do them fast, right? So I look for opportunities to um, develop solutions in an efficient way and accelerate through collaboration. Um, I forge in my, current, in my current role, I forge connections uh, between really hot technologies and players in the innovation ecosystem to bring solutions to market um, quickly and effectively. So, um, background is um, around 25 years of experience leading teams, uh, developing technology solutions uh, for both the public and the private sector. Um, some of these efforts have resulted in relationships with uh, companies from startups to Fortune Fives, um, universities, um, and, um, and individuals. Um, I've built non-traditional teams to address life-changing and um, really hard problems like um, stopping weapons of mass destruction from reaching the US um, and modernizing the IRS computer architecture. So um, from death to taxes, I'm your person. Um, I was drawn to creating new things, uh, teams, solutions, and strategies 
um, and inspired to build big, impactful new things, leveraging technology and from early days. Um, I had engineering internships with the Defense Mapping Agency, what was then the DMA, um, while I earned a bachelor's in physics. And I launched my post-college career as a contractor for the Air Force at Hanscom Air Force Base. Um, I started at the bottom of the ladder. Um, I was building presentations, um, printing on those old plastic view graph sheets. Remember those? And then putting them into binders, because that would be the way that we um, built a presentation um, and then shared them in person. Um, I took notes, you know, I wrote point papers, things like that. Um, all the while I looked for opportunities to do more and to take on more responsibility. Um, after several years, various, you know, similar roles all around in leading to kind of uh, project management type roles. Um, I was working for an exceptional leader who both introduced evolutionary operational technology um, to the Air Force, as well as kind of really um, led us with revolutionary thinking. Um, during a time when the military experienced a reduction in force, uh, contractors were relied upon more than ever. So he looked to us to, to take charge. He looked to us to be in more of leadership roles. Um, there was a time that I was actually um, telling the military folks what to do, which is unheard of you know, for a contractor to do. Um, and you know, he later laughed about that situation. But anyway, it was, um, it was really different. He was very open to different types of thinking. Um, so I let these teams developing solutions and conducting um, live military exercises and experiments. Um, I built a rapid prototyping lab with um, one of the prime con contractors and I invited companies to showcase their novel technologies to Air Force operators um, using a model aircraft. And we obtained um, user feedback and analysis. So those are really different types of things um, at the time. And all the while I was seeing raises of around, you know, one and a half, two percent a year um, over my starting salary after graduation. So the bottom line, I was still buying the same cheap beer <laughs> that I had during college. Um, next slide, please. So I looked around and I saw that I was performing a role with similar budget and complexity um, as others in my office. I had been in my role for several years at that point with a successful track record. And I decided that I was well postured to ask for a raise to bring myself up to the same level as um, some of the others. I saw this as a really simple pay inequity situation that I just had to raise awareness of and an adjustment would be made. After all, you know, I'd been brought up to believe that if I did good work and achieved what I set out to do, then I'd reap the rewards. Um, good grades, you know, high test scores, recommendations, all these things are kind of leading me to this kind of belief at the time. I you know, got a job offer, doors were opening, you know, so time for a promotion. So I did some homework and I asked a few people that I trusted for advice. Um, I didn't ask how much they made, but I told them what I made and I asked what was appropriate for my role, considering my capabilities and my accomplishments. Um, I built a graph that compared my salary and my role with others, um, put it onto a nice plastic view graph sheet and requested a meeting with my manager. So I thought my request was objective and it was straightforward. Um, we sat down in a conference room, we you know, engaged in a few pleasantries and I presented my case. I was astounded by the reaction. Next slide, please. My manager was incredulous. Um, he was offended by my request. In a nutshell, the response was no way. Next slide. He said, you know, I didn't know how these things worked, that I hadn't put in the time that others had. I needed more experience. I didn't know what they did and I hadn't seen what they had. Um, he said, I didn't know how it was done, this whole promotion thing. Um, but, you know, I certainly wasn't ready to be at their level. Whew. Okay, next slide, please. 
So my response, I was taken aback. Um, I felt badly that I asked. Um, I felt like I had offended him um, and I was really apologetic. I just sat there, you know, kind of sad and perplexed and, you know, upset that I had caused some trouble. Um, I didn't realize that I didn't know the process, um, but, you know, I was glad that now I was enlightened. So um, I thought, all right, well, I just keep continuing to do my good work and put in my time until they decide that I'm ready. So I internalized this message and I carried it with me for many years. Um, I saw peers recognized for accomplishments and in some cases promoted before I was. I didn't understand why or what they did that was significant to earn the recognition. Um, and to be frank, I ended up frustrated, discouraged, and sometimes resentful. But eventually, I thought my work would speak for itself and I'd be recognized. I'd wait my turn and leadership would tell me when I was ready. So the decades passed and I had wonderful opportunities um, and rose consistently in my career and emphasize the word consistently. Um, I did end up, you know, moving around, uh, taking different roles, gaining different experiences. So, you know, didn't stay there for too long, um, especially after that response. Um, as Carla Harris would say, I earned a lot of performance currency. So perform performance currency is that goodwill, uh, you know, the good reputation, the good capital that you create by doing your job well and delivering well on assignments. My successes allowed me to be selective in my projects, and I always sought out people I could learn from, like Brigida, and opportunities to create new things. Um, so I spent time developing relationships as well as generating ideas and, and executing on outcomes. So one day, I was kind of ruminating over a decision and talking with my boss at the time, um, someone I very much admired about the situation. She weighed in and then said, that I knew how to move forward. She said I had the answer. She also said that I should trust and could trust my intuition. So it struck me at that point, I realized what she was telling me. I had put the time in and I was ready. Next slide, please. So, I think about these two really formative career moments, one where I'm told I'm not ready and the next one where I'm told I'm ready. And I wonder whether I could have or should have pushed harder all those years ago. I wonder if I had done things differently, whether the trajectory of my career during the past two decades would have been faster, um, whether I could have earned more or accomplished more or done more. If I had shared more with my manager, you know, way back when about what I was doing, right? If I created a network of advocates to support my request for the promotion, things could have been different, I don't know. But what I do know is that it's been quite a ride and I'm super grateful for all the experiences I've had and the people I've been blessed to work with. Um, I do regret that when I asked for that promotion early in my career, I listened when they said I didn't know how it worked. And I listened when they said I wasn't ready. So that message replayed in my head for many years. And I, I do think it set me back in various ways. Now I know I am ready and I do know, <laughs> I, trust my, I trust my intuition. Um, so, you know, when I think back about it, I realize, or I, I guess I, I wonder and I realize that relationships with the decision makers are as important to getting things done um, and achieving impact as the good work itself. Um, so I'm still working on finding ways to identify and build relationships with the senior leaders, um, but it's difficult for me because I feel like, you know, I'm taking up their valuable time and I wonder how to open that door without feeling like, you know, I'm taking too much of that valuable time. Um, and then I also wonder, what if their priorities are different from mine? 
and they shouldn't be right. You know, I should be aligned with their priorities, but I do wonder about that sometimes. Um, because I have ideas about what I think are really important and I want to pursue those. Um, so I'd love to get your reaction um, and your thoughts on, on everything. Um, and I'm grateful for your time. Wow, um, there's so much stuff there. And um, I, 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 I want to start with like, I'm going to open this up, but I, it, the first thing I think of right now is uh, a very key class that I think, Stephanie, you were in a class with me, uh, and I know Brad's aware of it. It's called Power and Influence at um, Penn State, and they talk all about uh, Dr. Pfeffer's or stuff on hard work has nothing to do with promotions. Yeah. And I, I sometimes wish they would like give that for a required reading, I don't know, at 18. And I know, Stephanie, this has been a key area for you too. So I'm gonna call on Stephanie first because she's actually writing a book on this. And I wanted to get your feedback and your initial thoughts to Karen's story because that's one of the key areas I know you're in too. Yeah, early in the career, you still have to build out like you did, I think you did a great job putting it together and saying, these are the things, did you add that these are the things I've accomplished? I think I missed that part. Um, but, you know, it, it's really difficult, especially when you're early, especially if there it's, you know, one person deciding on if you're going to get that promotion or that raise. Um, but I think you did a really good job. Um, I think I would have went back and gotten the three or is it four no's and try to get my yes, I would have gone back a few more times. That's a great, that's a great thought. Yes. You know, in, in thinking about, um, in thinking about this story and thinking about the, you know, the, this topic of apologies and where they go wrong, it was, you know, what I, what I really landed on with this too, was that I was sorry, you know, for myself, I was sorry that, that, you know, I should have, I was apologizing to my younger self right? <laughs> for, um, for kind of internalizing it for so long too, you know, yeah. and I love the, idea of the um, you said the four no's, is that what it is? Yeah. So Kevin has something else to add to this too, because I know he's some, some of the back, some of the same more parallel backgrounds to you. So let's pivot over to Kevin and see what he has to say. So uh, you already hit on one, you know, the, the how well you do doesn't have a hell of a lot of correlation to anything. All right. Because other people take credit for your work and all sorts of stuff like that happen. So it's the having the uh, situational awareness of the office politics. All right. Um, you know, there's a lot of times it's if the boss is a guy is going to promote a guy instead of a, girl, a woman. I mean, it's just it, it's that kind of stupid stuff. Right. It's not about objective behavior. Um, you end up promoting people that you like or who are like you. Right? So if you're not one of the team, then you don't get promoted. So also, you know, so the other part of this is, uh, you know, you know this now, but you needed a alternative. So if the person you asked for a raise said no, you had another place to go to get the money, or at least move differently and get a little bit more money, right? Uh, so in general, if you're in an organization, you can go maybe one, maybe two layers up, unless you're the CEO's son or daughter, right? And then you got to go lateral to another peer institution to get that next promotion. And then you want to get into the boardroom, you got to do that, you got to do the, you know, altered stepping stone thing about three or four times, and you got to want it real bad. So if you're like, seems like you are a person just motivated by doing really good work, the people who are motivated to get promoted, get promoted before you do, because you're motivated about doing the work and they're motivated by getting promoted. Right. Right, right. So they're paying, they're kissing up to the boss and doing all those kinds of behaviors. And you're there thinking, well, if I just do really good work and I do much better than anybody else, they'll promote me wrong. Yeah. Right. They, they're making a lot of money off of you. You're doing great work. The client's happy and I don't have to pay you Jack, you know, why should I give you more money? Um, right. So it, it's all those you know, kind of human behavioral variables. I, I, I'm reason I'm, I, I, I'm like you, it's like, it's all about doing really good work. No, it ain't. All right. It's also the self-promotion part of it. And if you're not good at that, then um, you founder while other people who don't do as good at work get ahead. Uh, it, it's, 
it, it's mystifying in some level, but on another level, it just makes all sorts of sense, right? I mean, it's just, it's human behavior in tribes and you, know, you want to be the biggest person as a captain of the baseball team and all that kind of stuff, right? So it's all that human stuff in there and it's much less about who does the best work. Right. Uh, One of the things I always ask is, is it, I don't know about other people, but I think it's very uncomfortable to go in and say like, this is all the amazing stuff I do. And this is how I, I you know, move the ball forward and things like that. Um, and sometimes you look to have somebody else that advocates for you, but it's hard to find those people. And Elena just said, you know, the manager, the boss has a top card. So when they make their mind up, it's always up to them, right? But sometimes there are people that sort of advise the boss on stuff. There's there's the the little people that come in and go, you know what? I don't know what you're gonna do, but you sh you need to make sure this person's selected next, right? And 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 I wonder, do you know, do we do we have those people around enough? Do we, are we surrounding ourselves with those people? Karen, did you find those people, or did how did you sort of navigate that? You know, I think over the years, um, I have sought those people out. Um, was something that is still, you know, troubling me, and I kind of put this toward the end of the, the presentation is about, um, you know, that I think that conscientious part of me recognizing that, you know, time is, a pre time is precious, right? And so I don't want to take up other people's time for something that's about me. Um, so I'm still trying to get past that aspect of, of things or that hurdle, uh, you know, in building those relationships that really, you know, essentially are serving, serving to put me in a more powerful position. But at yeah. the same time, so I, I struggle with it, you know. Brad, you look like you're like on the edge of like, you have some thoughts. What are, what are yours as, as you know, the guy who's, who's watched this as both somebody who's an entrepreneur and somebody who teaches it also. Yeah, it's a really interesting, uh, inter very interesting topic. Um, I, I, unfortunately, the entrepreneurial in me um, usually walks out of situations like that. Um, I, I, I've, I've never, I make my, I make, I've always made my own promotions outside of corporations and inside of them, but I just rebuild something uh, it, whenever necessary. Um, but I, but Kevin is, I mean, na nailed it with, with, you know, it's, it's not how much work you do ever. It, I mean, that never really enters into it and, and, um, power and influence. So the course I teach, uh, for, for MBA is, is, um, is, is one-on-one -on -one negotiations, but we do a fair amount on, on, on influence. And, uh, we do that section on collecting those and you really haven't started negotiating anything until somebody says no. Um, but in any case, any negotiation for a job, to get a new job, to get, to get a new client, to get, uh, you know, um, wh whatever it is, and um, purchasing something, it always involves adding issues. Um, if, if it's just a job, you know, if you're just talking about a job, it's sort of a, a uh, what we call a distributive negotiation, a distributive one, one topic thing that you're kind of almost haggling a little bit. And, and it seems to me like what, what uh, Karen really, you really brought to this, to this story is that there was, there were more issues involved. And we say, you're really not negotiating anything when you're haggling, you're, you're getting kind of stuck on in this, uh, just throwing numbers against the board and, and you're stuck you really don't begin to negotiate until you can start bringing in multiple issues that have varying degrees of value to the different parties that are negotiating. Right. And so, um, you know, all of a sudden you realize that, oh, hey, the value here was, you know, the pecking chain uh, being in this, in this chain and, and, uh, and, 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 you know, you couldn't break out of it. I, I like to tell the story of the two different meeting places that we have as human beings. And there are two. And when you get to multiple individuals, there are two kinds of meeting places. One is what I refer to in my classes as um, the water, the watering hole. Okay, the water cooler, the watering hole. And the watering hole is the one that Brigitte was just describing, where 
when you see it in nature, in, in, I've been in the Middle East, I've been in places where you, you see it, the watering hole and all of the animals line up together. It's the lions with the lions, the zebras with the zebras, the gazelles with the gazelles. And, and that's the description that Brigitte is just describing to me. And, and, and it's a pecking order and, and don't, don't be a goose and, and, and walk over to the lions. You know, that, that just doesn't happen. And that sounds like the situation Karen was describing in a lot of ways. The other kind of meeting we refer to as, as, the, as the fire, as the, the bonfire, the campfire, and where everybody hunkers around a campfire like we're doing here. Like, I don't know where any of you are from. I have no idea what your levels of competence and, and amazingness and your accreditations. And I mean, I'm just nobody, right? Like, I'm, it's like you all know me as just some dude who happens to be a pilot. And that's what we're doing here right i mean we're this is this is a campfire anybody we're all in hollywood squares here we're all in the brady bunch uh um zeitgeist you know and uh you know we're looking at each other and pointing and alice is karen i guess you're alice uh, right now because you're sort of right in the middle um <laughs> but but that's but so that so that's the funny the interesting thing is when you can take the dynamic of a campfire and move it into your watering hole and that's where you all of a sudden discover pathways that never existed before. And, and we used to call that the old boy network. And of course, that's a, a misogynist term. We're not allowed to say that anymore, but it's the old, what it, fill in the gender blank network club. And, uh, and, it's, and it's amazing how, to, to me, what you've described is such a beautiful picture and, and what you've been through of, of really, you didn't really get to the campfire until you all of a sudden found out you were at the campfire, there was no key. There was no way of getting in. It's almost like the um, Bohemian Grove. You know, you can't just show up at the Bohemian Grove campfire. You just have to find yourself there. And there you are. And then all of a sudden, you're at a different level in the watering hole. So anyway, I don't know, whatever that was worth to you. It's, uh, you I am fascinated, really. This is what a wonderful story. And thank you so much for sharing, Karen. Oh, I look. think yeah, it's really interesting. Like, I'll, I'll, I think also you say like what I knew from my old, from my, my pre, apologize to my previous self. What would you tell a person now? What should she have done instead of apologize? Wait, are you asking me? I'm, I'm asking Karen. Sorry. No, I was going to say, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, oh, Karen, that's right. Good. Well, um, so. I think that what I would do is point out some of these things that, that you all have shared with me, right? The, the, you know, getting past the first to know, you know, looking around who else can, you know, the way that I was thinking about is who else could advocate, advocate for me. Um, the, you know, the situation that Brad mentions of the watering hole and in the campfire, I, I love that, you know, in the fact that someone had to tell me that I was at the watering or at the campfire. I didn't even realize I was there, you know, <laughs> someone had to say, and I still don't feel like I'm there, you know, um, the, it's part of that imposter syndrome. Like, I mean, you name it, I feel like I have it. <laughs> um, so, so or, or at least there are aspects of many of these different kinds of situations that, that resonate with me. Um, so, so I think Brigitte, to answer your question, I would, I would, point out to my younger self, hey, think about this might be happening here, this might be happening here. Um, you know, you, you made an assumption that your good work would speak for itself. What you need to realize is dot, 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 you know. Kevin, did you want to add some stuff to that? Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, I, so this is just so, uh, I, I'll, a similar example, a uh, friend of mine, uh, uh, asked for some help because one of his friends, this is the old boy and gal network, um, had totally misread the situation in the office she was in. She thought she was going to get a promotion and be the boss, and they fired her. Uh, oh, 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 of course, she didn't read it very well because it was all men everywhere, and she was the one woman. So kind of lack of situational awareness there on her part. Um, and uh, she had a very specialized skill set, basically a kind of a developer and so I said well yeah I can help you and 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 I tried to explain to her how to do a resume and put it on LinkedIn and get a job and she just was clueless it was like notes she couldn't hear 
So some of this is, you know, you just, if you don't have it in your DNA, you just don't know, you can't hear the music. Uh, so I, I grabbed a resume, I put it together and I shopped it to about five people and she got a job the next week. Um, right. So, uh, so sometimes it's, you just don't hear the music. So they're dancing and you don't even know what music is playing and you just, you know, you just don't know. And it happens. Um, you're just tone deaf uh, to some of this stuff. So some people have that stuff in their, you know, they end up being politicians and salespeople and they, they got that EQ, right? About the whole human thing, how the, how the campfire works, who gets to talk next to the campfire, right? Who queues up at the watering hole? Uh, other people are just clueless. I'm one of the clueless. So, I mean, observed behavior, it helps a little bit, but it means I don't hear it. So it, it's it just, so some of the stuff is just, it's in your DNA, right? You know, if you're going to be president of the United States, you probably know that about the time you're 10, you don't suddenly figure it out when you're 25, right? You either got it or you don't, right? Yeah. Bill, you wanted to add to that too? Yeah, well, I think part of the situation is been ability to read things. How mission critical are you? How desperate is the organization for success? And that relates partly to how you're treated. And really good people can be taken advantage of and really good people can uh, get uh, recognition notice and all that. And I think one of the things you reflect maybe uh, from Kevin is there's an aspect of a Russian roulette. And so you've got to read it right. And then you've got to somehow maneuver it if you've got into a thing where you've got the capability, the expertise and talent to do good, but you're somehow not getting the recognition reward. And that's a difficult path. But knowing where you are and being able to read things is, is very important. But again, it, it depends what organization you're in. You know, are you mission critical? How desperate is the organization for success? How valuable are you to them? I think I'd, I'd like to go back and I apologize for those of you that didn't get to go to the December session, but Marty had a, a session then he talked about how he did a mess up that really like ended up shutting down an entire computer system for the entire weekend and um, got it uh, on, on Monday, the CEO, the head of, was it the D Department of Justice and the head of the White House security were all in the front office going, guess what you did, right? And what happened there was, I thought was very interesting was that his boss realized that he had you know, done something, but not at a negative thing. But what was more interesting was that his customers said, what you did was something we need to learn from and you're a really key thing. And I wonder, Karen, are your customers also stepping up to you and helping you in that space and saying, you know what, we need this person. And, and Elena's right too, being the right time in the right place. But also, do we need our customers advocating better for us as well? Marty or Karen, do you have any thoughts on either of those? Sorry, Marty. Well, I, I, I was really lucky with that event. That should have been a career ender to look at it on the surface. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of that was you talk about doing a good job is not the thing that gets you promoted or gets you to actually keep your job when you were likely to be fired. I was very well liked. And immediately everybody in my organization said, oh, there's no way Marty did that on purpose. There's, there's no way. Okay. And, you know, it's like, hey, better to have this cool dude step on a landmine than, you know, somebody else. And uh, so, so you're blessed I, in that I, way. Yeah, I was, I was lucky in that part, you know, and it's funny. Um, you talk about apologies. I actually kind of went on an apology tour after that whole thing. <laughs> and uh, that actually got me my next promotion and my next job. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Glenn and then Stephanie also had some comments. Glenn, why don't you go ahead? Sure. I, I think one concern I have is we, we talk about this as Karen's um, mistake and her her absorbing it and internalizing it and, and feeling an apology for it a lot of times it's about the superiors too and it's not just having a relationship but it's knowing what is their personality type so with a very good boss i have taken bad news and they have appreciated someone being willing to articulate um 
truth to power. With a psychopath, um, I took truth to power and they just danced on my head. And, um, and, and it was very painful. Um, a lot of times then this is, if you have that type of a boss and if you think you have developed that type of power, um, then I would really encourage someone to, to look for a lateral move and, and get out of that environment because as long as that person is there, um, they're going to be your glass ceiling. And um, um, going to another place will allow you to um, get additional experiences, but it'll also enable you to uh, potentially get um, people who can see your value and, and recognize it in terms of, of promotions. Um, it helps a lot to develop relationships with, se with seniors and to help them see the value you provide, but all organizations have turnover. And when there's turnover, um, those values that they um, put most weight on can change overnight. And you have to um, especially spend time with them to find out what were the, what are the new um, characteristics that this organization um, values and that the top management values, because if you don't figure it out, um, you'll be part of the um, uh, desire of top management to make changes uh, that'll make the uh, organization run more effect, run more effectively, um, uh, air quotes on that one. So thank you. Stephanie, you're all about effectiveness. Go ahead, oh, you're muted. I was trying to get my mouse to move, it wasn't cooperating. So, you know, the male perspective here, it's, it's interesting to see because we women, we do not think like that. We do not approach things like that. We put together our, our binder and we go, and then we apologize for bringing our binder. So, you know, the male perspective, although it's helpful um, for us to learn it and us to hear it, um, but, but that's not how we process things. Um, you know, we are different. So, you know, in, in Brad's class, he talked about collecting no's. So the first time you go and he says no, um, you know, also saying, okay, well, what would make you say yes? And then when he has his list, okay, when is a good time for you and I to schedule our next appointment so I can show you I've accomplished these items you recommend, and then we can talk about my promotion then. Because if you don't set up another time, then like you said, the years will go by where you're still working hard watching others move ahead. And, and feeling like, you know, what about me? I'm being left behind. Um, but it is intimidating to return, right? And ask again. Um, but if you don't ask, then time will go. That's I a good point. Yeah. Okay, Karen, I, I wonder, Karen, did you ever go back? Or did you get shamed out of the room? <laughs> I did not go back um, to that individual. I looked for another um, position. Uh, so and it, it was the right time for me to move on anyway. So that I will say that's something that I, I have always, um, I'm kind of a change junkie. You know, I love, I love new things. And so um, that I realized in looking back that, you know, it, it was time. So um, I, I have a quick question. I, I hate to take up too much time, um, but a question for Brad, going back to the watering pool and the bonfire, I wonder if there can be multiple bonfires in an organization. Oh, so, yes. absolutely. In fact, that's the whole point of the of the the, bond, the campfires is that they're they're in the weirdest places and there are multiples of them everywhere. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thinking, right. I'm thinking, you know, almost at, at every <clears throat> excuse me, level, say if you're in a large corporation, you could say at every level you can rise to that that place or be in that place where you feel comfortable, you know, at, in the campfire that you're sitting around. Um, and then maybe you aspire to, to the next campfire, right? <laughs> so to speak. So the one with better food, right? One with better, right. Exactly. Better music, you know, yeah. <laughs> so right. Yeah. It's an interesting way to think about things. They, they don't, not only that, I mean, they are outside of the, the corporation within the corporation. I mean, they're at your, these, 
the campfire is your tennis club. It's your swimming club. It's the, it's that you're bringing your kids to the same swim team. It's, it's um, in my case, it's uh, my flight school. Uh, my flight school has been the best campfire I've, I've ever imagined. I think the contacts that I have made, I got my job at Penn state as the, you know, associate director of the entrepreneur center by accident. I mean, I, I had no intention of that ever happening, but it happened in my campfire in my two seat airplane. The campfires are there. You have to keep your eyes open because they're there. And then once you're in one, it's like, holy crap, look where I am. And, and next thing you know, you're, you're back at the water hole in it, in it amongst, amongst the zebras now, instead of the, instead of the, you know, the ducks. And that's a good point. I think uh, I always joke that I can look around a room and I am like what Kevin says, I can't hear the notes. I don't have the best EQ and I'm slowly developing it. And I joke that my husband has always had a really good EQ and I'll try to argue with him about it. And because a lot of times it's a story I don't want to hear. But I always wonder, Scott, when you were developing your EQ, because I, my husband, for those of you who don't know, he at 26 was the, was a GS 15 step 10 with no degree completely and that's not. unheard of right so he but that was largely because who he knew and how he managed that so scott why don't you talk a little bit more about how you managed that room you said develop eq and, and i don't know that i did that or i wasn't consciously doing that i'll be totally honest i didn't sit back with my notebook and go I, i've got a plan this is how people will like me um i uh I had some brave ideas about how to go to work um, that were born out of just, I wanted to do something in the world. And then, and I found my bonfire around technical people. And uh, that probably early bonfire it, it was, you seem like you're not afraid of management. So you go tell them what we need and we'll wait here. So I would go do that. I would go foray into management uh, when I was in the Air Force and then when I got out. Uh, and found that I could play translator between bonfires. I could transact back and forth. And I started picking up on cues that made it easier for me to do that. So again, I wasn't developing EQ, but I was probably developing some, some tricks. Like for example, there was a time in industry where Dilbert Scott Adams and software and hardware development were so closely bonded and I remember saying this to a boss who stared at me in an airplane. He just couldn't believe I said it. I said, when we visit vendors and we visit customers, I read the Dilberts because it tells me what's going on here. The ones that are constantly about lagging deployments and lagging product tell me they have product problems. That's why they're up there. And I don't say it out loud, but I'm picking up on it. So when we have a conversation about teaming up and I say, well, how are you guys doing on meeting your objectives and milestones? I know I can push there maybe a little more in the negotiation than cold because I know they have this problem. Otherwise, all these wouldn't be funny. They wouldn't be all over the place. So I would pick up cues that I could use. And I remember he looked at me because I never even thought of that. I said, you ought to look at the Dilbert you have up. It's displaying what you identify with. And people like me are seeing that and using that. So I don't know that I actively developed it. It just kind of occurred to me that it resonated. Um, so, and, and a bonfire story, I mean, and again, I, I don't often know what it is. When Brigitte and I were early on in our marriage, I got invited to a program to see if I wanted to be a part of it. And I didn't know what it was. And I went to the site, it was classified. And I wasn't sure I was there. And it didn't seem like there was a really very heavy need. Uh, and I smoked back then. And the guy running it asked me for a cigarette out behind the building. And, and we, we lit our cigarettes and he goes, no one knows we're here. We want to add someone to the team and we pick you. There's not much work to do here. It's not very hard. They love us and they'll never find you. Do you want in? And I didn't do it, but it was the weirdest thing. I was like, how did I? He's like, yeah, like the, us at the bonfire saw you. So we're, 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 there's room for one more. And I thought, wow, they're, what a strange, how did I get here? And is this, you know, it was just really weird. So sometimes I don't understand what people see in me, but I'm working off of cues. And I'm trying to also, as I, as I matured, I asked the question I was doing it before this, I was on a call and I asked people, what does success look like? And then I drill down and backwards about what they're trying to do. Sometimes people aren't honest about what success looks like, or they've got a clear view and it helps me see. And if they say I'm identifying with them more and there's more EQ there, okay. Uh, but 
yeah, I, I don't know if they're actively developing. So I'd like to take that that theme around sort of observing what's going on in a room because I think Trent um, Trent is is a visual storyteller, um, I, and I'm probably giving the, the wrong verbiage for that. Um, does that really, really well. And I'd like to hear some of your secret sauce and what you're looking for in the same way. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, and, and first and foremost, I've enjoyed the session here. Um, at, a, at a high level, what's been fascinating to me as our conversations unfolded is this movement from what I would call um, hindsight to foresight, where we've talked a little bit about the lessons of the past in order to inform where any of us or our colleagues or our friends could go and what they could learn from us along that journey. And, um, you know, I love the Dilbert example and looking for some of those cues around an organization. And we've probably all been in those scenarios where you walk into a meeting with a new team or a new group, and you can tell right away if this is a group that, that clicks together or this is a group that um, things are just not right. And from an individual perspective, as an employee with different organizations, um, what's come to mind for me over the course of our conversation here are, are three words that, that I wrote down. Um, the first of those is allegiance, and that can work both ways, right? And we, we all know people who are um, so aligned and have such a high level of allegiance to their organization that they aren't willing to leave no matter what. Um, you know, I've had those colleagues who take the the commuter bus to the Pentagon for three hours every day. And, you know, that's where their allegiance lies. Um, there are others who hop from job to job to job because that's where their heart lies as well. And they've harnessed some of the lessons learned that we've talked about here today. Um, the second word that I wrote down here is mobility. And I'm really fascinated by what we're learning right now in our remote work environment. Um, and some of the, the, the data that I've seen recently uh, is that nearly a third of the U.S. professional workforce imagines that they will be in a different job one year from now. That's a pretty amazing and significant number of people who would be transitioning to new careers, new employers, one third of the U.S. professional workforce. And at the same, same time, um, what I saw recently from the Department of Labor suggests that there are half a million new jobs per month in the U.S. in 2021. And so opportunity is out there for people who are questioning their allegiance to employers and have some of that you know, mobility and the ability to move from place to place. And the, the third word that I wrote down here is comfort. And that ultimately, I think, becomes a personal decision. You know, are we comfortable to move to a new location, take less pay, have a higher workload, and even overcoming that fear of going into a new organization with new names and new faces and having to kind of relearn another culture. So that's, that's kind of what's been bubbling up for me here. And I take those three words and can see myself applying those to groups that I, I walk into and, and interact with as a, a professional facilitator and someone who does team performance full-time. That's a really good point. I think comfort is a key thing. Um, and I was telling before everybody else on the thing on, on the call was we have a new head of science and technology in, in the organization I support. And I thought it was really quite compelling that in his bio, he put as a key thing that he's interested in is, is establishing psychological safety in, across the organization. And I know Melinda mentioned she's in social work and psychology as a background and you saying with comfort, um, really being able to give people that sense of, of I can trust, I, I feel that I can give you what Glenn talked about, the truth to power without getting slaughtered for it. Talk to Karen, you know, I can have a conversation about a promotion um, without getting, you know, told that I'm, I'm a, you know, high maintenance pain in the ass millennial or whatever, right? These are the types of things that we need to establish better, um, especially because the people, the organizations that do do that, that do offer that comfort, that do do, do that psychological safety, they're going to be where people are going to go. The, people are going to take their ball and say, you know what, I can get offered the same money or better to go over here and I'll feel safe here. And I'll know somebody will have my back 
and I will know that no matter what happens, um, I'm going to grow. And you know what? My promotion, it may be that I get a better beer every single month, or it may be that I can get six extra hours of um, vacation a year or whatever, right? And learning how to negotiate that is, is a key thing also I learned from, from Brad's class and, and and I'm, I'm going to fall back on Brad's class, not because uh, Brad's class is cool, but you start, we start, when we start looking outside those four corners of a contract and four corners that def define us, and I'm sorry, Harvey, I know I'm breaking your heart saying the contracts aren't everything in the world. My, my father-in-law, Harvey, is a contracts guy. Um, but when we, we, we break free of some of those parameters, and I think that's especially hard for um, women, and, and I'm going to put this in my thing, because we tend to to fit boxes a little bit better. Um, and so we start seeing and say, you know what I would rather have? I would rather have 20% more time than 20% more money. Um, I would rather have a job where I can meet more people than a job that provides me with a bigger like title, the deputy, the assistant to the deputy. I don't care, right? And I think what, when we hear, especially as, as we move into leadership positions, when we have a conversation with people like Karen, what do we need to help those people grow so they don't leave our organization? That's what I worry about. Um, how do we keep the Karens in the room there working with us? Or if you're a person like Karen, when do you say, you know what? I'm not gonna apologize anymore for being me. So Karen, when, do you, when did you stop apologizing? and start moving forward? Uh, well, great question. I, uh, I think it may, I think that may have actually been a bit of a trigger for me. Um, you know, when I, when I did a bit of reflection, right? As, as I said, I, I moved on to a, a different job after that. Um, after that experience, um, I think partially because, and, and if I saw it correctly in the chat here, somebody mentioned something about shame. I, you know, I was apologetic and I was also you know, kind of ashamed that I asked, right? Because I really was, um, what I took, you know, out of that interaction was that I didn't know something that I should have known. Um, even though there was really no way of me for me to have known because I wasn't part of that campfire, right? So, um, so I think I, I, you know, I don't want, um, I don't mean to communicate here that that I don't have a relatively strong personality because I do, but um, but I did also I recognize that I carried that that with me that message throughout. So I think that um, it it may have also, you know, in a very positive way affected the way that I lead people and that I try to be very open and straightforward and um, forthright with people and establish a place of comfort because I have been in that place where I felt so uncomfortable. And, and that, there's nothing worse than that. I think feeling like you're not part of the bonfire or maybe you are, but you're just the next meal, right? Um, is a really uncomfortable place to be. Um, my, my husband used to watch me in this one department I was in, in in MITRE previously. And he said, do you start off the meeting wanting to piss them off or you just go through the meeting and like poke at them, right? Just arbitrarily. And the problem was not that I wanted to get, get them mad. It was because I saw all these issues and I was like, let's do something about them as opposed to like admiring them endlessly. And I think, you know, you can't when force accountability on people who spent a career avoiding it successfully. That's true. That's true. Um, and, and the question is, is, is you know, I can't, um, I, I have to stop caring about that enough to like put the vest around myself and start heading out. Marty, you had a thought on that too. Well, the thought... <clears throat> Wait, you're off, you're off mute. You're on mute. There Sorry. Um, I, I was sitting here thinking about um, discussions associated with campfires, water coolers, that kind of stuff. And I'm realizing that in my career, I intentionally exploited that stuff to good effect a lot. I'll, I'll confess that now. And in fact, the most successful 
attempts at it. Um, I discovered that um, there was networking going on just outside the door where the smoking lounge was. <laughs> okay, I wasn't a smoker. I found, I had followed a guy out one time when we were discussing about a program because that's the time that he had. You could get him talking or whatever. And while I was out in the smoking lounge, I like met real big wigs, people that could really help and suddenly be able to say hello in the elevator and they recognize your face. And then suddenly you realize you can get traction with people that know you. Um, they don't have to know much else about you except conversations as you had outside. Cause you know, there everybody would introduce themselves and shake hands and, and, and that kind of stuff. So look for those watering holes, look for those water coolers especially today in the, in the modern world. It's really, you know, it's, it's interesting. In the last post that I had, I was working at um, NRO and I joined um, Toastmasters there, right? Because, you know, by then my author career was uh, ramping up and I wanted to be able to be a better public speaker. I started networking with people at Toastmasters that I never would have met otherwise. You talk about four-star yes. generals. There were four-star generals there. Really? And and stuff. So it's it's really uh interesting. Keep your eyes open for those watering holes, for those water coolers, for those little campfires, and be sensitive to them. And um you you know, they help. And I have yeah. found that to be true. Yeah. Brad, you also wanted to saw you wanted to point something out along Marty's thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to make a clear that the, the, the way that I was describing the difference between a watering hole and a campfire, a campfire is literally a place where you can't poke anybody. It's it's where where I can say whatever the hell's on my mind and nobody gives a crap because nobody knows who I am. I want to make sure I distinguish between those two, at least for what I teach. Um, and these, by the way, come from uh, Jamie O'Boyle and Dr. Margaret King, who, who uh, actually first uh, introduced this word to me. They're, they uh, they co-wrote some books with me. Um, campfire is a place where you can't poke people, okay? Because I don't give a crap who you are, and I'm just going to say what's on my mind, and you don't give a crap who I am, and you're just going to say what's on your mind. That is not a watering hole. A watering okay. hole is where the animals go to drink water. And if you've ever been to the African areas and you see a watering hole, it's where the lions sit with the lions. The zebras are with the zebras. You are not going to walk in amongst the zebras and ask for a smoke, okay? That's not happening. So if you think you're in that place where you are distinct, distinctly aware of the ranking of people that are there, or that if you think that you have to be a certain way, or if that you think by poking somebody, you're, you're not gonna go anywhere, you are not at a campfire. That is not what I'm talking about. Campfire, you can fart into the wind, into the fire, and everybody laughs at the sparks. Okay? Brad, I'll be curious. It, you know, I think through movies, I brought this up before, and I know some of the folks on here have seen the movie Stir Crazy. Yes, great one. So then the scene with Gene Wilder where he's in the chow hall and Grossberger comes in, and it's a water yes. hole, and he decides he's going to be the gazelle that says a lot high to the lion. And it's hilarious because I don't know who that person is in the real world that decides to do it. And of course, they have this incredible story arc. But and I imagine the watering hole. I'm imagining Gene Wilder going, hello. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To the guy who murdered 25 people. That's a very funny one, Scott. Yeah, I love that. I love that movie. And, and you know, I, I, that doesn't really fit into the paradigm that I'm going with here. <laughs> but but, uh, but, but I, I think it's, it's, when, it's when you're with a group of people who you literally don't care about. And they literally don't care about you. And you're only talking about this, this activity that is this fire, right? We always say that like campfire eating, the best, best example of campfire eating in America is pizza, okay? Everybody eats on the pizza. Everybody pulls from the pizza. You're like in this pizza. It's in the center of you. You're pulling from this thing that you're all engaged in. And that's like a, that's like a, a modern campfire experience. Um, and that's what we're talking about. So it, so if you if you realize who the gazelles are, you're not at a campfire. 
Good, good idea. Yeah. I, I, so one thing I will throw out this and, and um, if you want to see like an early um, fight between my husband and I, one, because I maybe had no money, but he would eat, go out to eat for lunch every single day with somebody from the office. And then I would eat at my desk because I was so busy. Um, and what happened there is exactly what you're talking about. It's that I always thought like he's spending money fecklessly and I'm a GS7 and I make no money. And doesn't he understand that he's spending all this money? For him, it was expanding and strengthening so many more relationships that way than I did sitting at my desk eating my lunch, no matter how healthy and, you know, economically smart it was. And I think that's the other thing that I hear you talking about is it is a choice that we have to sort of drive to, to get there and not just count our time as the time that we're doing work. It's also the time that we're outreaching outside of our, our exact area. Um, so that was, and I know we've gone over and I, I'm, I don't want to take you guys too long. Um, so Karen, I, I want to hear from you because um, this is both the first time you shared a story and, and you know, as we move forward, what do you think um, you took away most from this group and where do you think we should go next? Oh, um, so I am just so grateful um, to everyone's thoughts and, and responses to what I shared um, and, and appreciate, Brigitte, your pulling us together and you're inviting me um, tonight. So it gave me an opportunity to think a lot about, um, you know, experiences in my past that, that I thought might be worth sharing. Um, and, you know, in, in bouncing some ideas off of you too, you know, this one seemed to be one that might resonate, resonate you know, with the group. Um, I really love um, hearing from everyone, you know, these different kind of the, the concepts that are related. Um, I'm gonna be thinking a lot about, you know, the allegiance, mobility and comfort, the, um, of course, the watering hole and the campfire, the great, great resignation versus um, great renegotiation. And Brigida, I saw that in the chat and I think that that could be really interesting if you haven't um, already discussed that um, to bring that to the group. Um, there's so much around that, that topic. You know, when is it, when is it appropriate to, um, to choose one path or the other, right? And what are the factors that might go into that kind of decision? Um, this group seems to be really thoughtful and willing to share experiences. So um, I'm very much looking forward to the next next time we get together. So thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. I think this is the hardest part. This is truly what Brene Brown talks about when she talks about vulnerability and it, it's tough, right? And we've had people on here that have cried. We've had people on here that I've cried. You know, I, I think Stephanie at one point said, you know, I think when we were four sessions in, she goes, we finally had a session where you didn't cry. So, um, but this is a lot and this is hard. And um, sometimes I think, you know, one of the biggest things that we learn from each other is um, give us permission, ourselves permission to, to sort of look back and go, wow, that was, that was a while ago. That didn't work for me, but it got through it. Um, but also um, bring in more people because I think the best thing we can do is we shouldn't have any more shitty leaders out there. And so we should be creating better leaders, um, both from ourselves and for others. So um, be sure to get out there. I'll, I'm, I'm trying to get better at posting. I'm, I'm not. Um, but And bring more people in. Um, give me feedback as to what I need to do better. Um, and if you want to share your story, next month's story is... Um, nothing good happens from reply all. Um, so, uh, um, and that's from an organization that hits reply all a lot. And uh, so, um, so you know, head, head, if you have some a story you want to share or somebody else you think you should share, give me a heads up on that. Um, and um, I, I appreciate all of you guys joining us and we'll see you guys next month then. All right, take care. Thanks again for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.